All right, hello. My name is Elizabeth, and I want to talk about Git. What I hope to give you today is motivation for learning and practicing and teaching Git. And to do that, I'm going to take us back to a time when I did not Git anything at all. <laughs> in a previous life, I lived in Bergen um, and ran my own business designing and building custom websites for my, uh, for my clients. Uh, when the JavaScript conference WebRevels became a new client, that was the very first time I ever collaborated on code with developers. So at this point, I had been writing CSS for a living for seven years. But I was self-taught, and I had never before had a project where the other people involved knew so much more than me about building something for the web. Finally, a client that I could learn from. But picking up Git that first year, that was too hard. So I wrote static HTML and CSS that I sent via email to the organizers in Oslo. <laughs> they took the code I had written into a Node.js Node app on GitHub. After we launched, I even sent edits to my own code, still via email. But the following year, we made an opportunity for them to show me this thing on my computer called a terminal. And they taught me how to use Git instead of email. And this brings us to the very core of what Git is. Git is a system for distributed version control, making it easier for multiple humans at different computers to work together on developing software over time. And when I say make it easier, we don't always feel that way about Git. Uh, this talk is not an introduction to Git. And if you're sitting here and I'm using like all words you're not familiar with, don't worry about it. Uh, Git is one of those things to learn gradually, kind of absorb over time. And what I hope is that my enthusiasm for choosing to learn more Git is something that you can take, uh, take with you. And then go find the type of people who, if you show up with an interest for learning, they'll be the type of people who want to teach you. And for everyone here who is already really comfortable with Git, this is your task, to figure out how to be that person who others want to approach when they need help getting out of a mess or they want to talk about how to uh, refine their, their workflow. Because as they say, it takes a village to make a developer. And learning Git is definitely something that for most of us will never ever happen by reading the documentation. Also not really from a talk like this. I think it happens best in conversations with other people about specific problems to, to solve. And when you do know your way around those problems, you can still really benefit from others who are confused about a thing with Git to challenge your ability to explain that, that thing. So fast forward 10 years from my days of uh, emailing code. And today I work as a developer at Amedia. We're owned by a foundation and publish 100 plus media sites from all corners of Norway. Uh, most of these are local or regional newspapers with uh, roots that can go back a century and that today they're doing pretty well as digital products. This matters because Norway now has a more diverse range of editorial media than many other countries do. Let's take a peek at the kind of code base we have in the product and technology department where I work or the part of the media where I work. 756 repos. Okay. We also replace an archive, so the number of repositories maintained today is 483. And I have no idea how many people in total have contributed over time, but today we're 115 people who commit to this code base. And we had 20,000 pull requests merged the past year. That becomes a lot of Git history. Hold that thought for a bit, because Git history is something we'll come, we'll come back to. But I promised some rants, and the first rant we're going to cherry pick is don't let anybody tell you how you should use Git, including me. 
Also know assumptions about what you're supposed to know about Git. If you have a workflow with different tools uh, that work for you, that's great. But with that said, we're going to whip out some commands. So git status add, add dot for everything, commit dash m, push, pull, and some kind of approach for working with branches. For a really long time, this was my entire toolbox. And I got a long, long way with that. So, so why learn more than this? Why learn more Git than absolutely necessary? And I don't care about trying to impress anyone with like Git foo or that kind of uh, thing. So let me try and explain why learning more Git has been something that I've chosen to, to do. So code is read a gazillion times more often than it's written. Now, many people have said this kind of thing. It's actually kind of true for text in general. <laughs> but for, um, for programming, I think the point of the statement is to remind ourselves that other people, probably also yourself, will need to try to parse this stuff and make some kind of sense of it. It's not just computers. Also, humans need to read your, read your code. And a longer, well-written commit message provides helpful context for why the change was made. Not just what, but an additional explanation about why. The, the, the diff itself can only show which lines changed. And if I take the time to think properly about the context and manage to write that down, this is helpful for the next person who comes along to read the code. And that grateful person might be myself in two years. Or next Thursday, when I will also have completely forgotten why my change was, my change was made. So your Git history is documentation. And it can be total crap, it can be completely missing, or it can be potentially excellent. And what I find really interesting about the documentation I can leave behind with a Git commit is that unlike other types of documentation, the Git history follows its own, uh, its own timeline. The documentation that is written in a commit message is tied to the code and does not get outdated. Code comments, they get outdated so fast that we make jokes about it. And readme files it can be really difficult to know if they're current or, uh, or not. But any documentation with a commit is directly coupled to whatever version, uh, version of running, running code. It still might be wrong but it has this potential to represent our current best understanding um, about a code change. And it's a hell of an opportunity because the context we have in our brains at the time of making a, making a commit, that context is often lost if we don't write it down. Now, if people don't think about Git as documentation, then trying to read Git history becomes a lot less useful. But I think it matters. So I try to make an effort in crafting my commits. So what makes a good commit? People often talk about it being scoped and atomic, like it's wrapped up in this, this diff, these lines that have been changed that are, are uh, together in a commit with, with intention. And it has a subject line and also a message body describing why. But to get more control over what makes a commit, um, we're going to need a larger toolbox. Now, I'm going to race us through some more commands that I like to use. And my intention with this next upcoming part is uh, not really to explain the details of these commands, but more to like paint a picture of the, of the possibilities. So caution, this is going to get a little bit blurry. But I will make the slides available after if you want to pick up any, any details. So, options, options, options. I think git diff was also one of the first commands I picked up, but it took me a really long time to understand that I could actually tack on different options to give me more, uh, to give me more information. And after I started collecting more and more of them and practice putting them to use, they, they become very useful to, uh, to play around with, to understand what's going on in my working directory and, and the staging. So instead of working directory and staging being these steps that I 
just go through because some guy in Sweden designed it that way, then then it becomes a playground that I can I can actually actually use. This is a more recent uh, option that I'm really happy about. <laughs> Because when I work with node apps and uh, try to keep the uh, dependencies, dependencies updated, that lock file can 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 create really large diffs that aren't really intended for for humans to to, to read. Um, I might make an alias of this, but maybe not because I kind of like the idea of getting getting the syntax into my finger so that I can use use this to also exclude other files. Not just uh, lock, lock files. And slow staging. So the command I started using was git add dots, which just takes everything that I don't really remember what is anymore uh, and stages it. But what I prefer to use today is the git add uh, patch, uh, dash p for, for short. And it has this hilarious description in, in Git that's it's called to select hunks interactively. <laughs> so it it asks me, uh, it, it will go through. So it really really slows down the staging uh, process. I need I need to reconsider. I need to to think about the different parts of um, of the uh, edits. Do I want to stage this now? Yes or no, or split this up and ask me again. Yes, everything in this file, or dismiss this file completely. And I really get, like this habit of doing it. It takes a little bit longer, but it means I have this opportunity to revisit uh, and to, to, to split up what I stage or, or not. I also really like uh, trying to write longer commit messages with both a subject line and a body. So where I started, uh, was using the dash m and then just writing uh, the subject title directly. But what I prefer to use today is to use uh, git commit without the option. The thing that happens then is that git will open an editor. And I really, really, really recommend to give yourself an editor to live with. <laughs> because this is a blog post I recently wrote. And a very common hurdle to learn Git operations like uh, interactive rebase or writing longer commit messages is the setting that chooses an editor for Git. If you haven't set anything, uh, it will be the shell default, and that will probably be Vim. So if you want to use a different editor, which many of us do, <laughs> then it's really, really helpful to uh, first, before you want to uh, commit with a message body, it's really helpful to first make sure you understand which editor the Git will, Git will open. Show the last five, five commits. Minus, minus five will show me the last five. And I can also tack on different options to this, like stats, which helps me remember a bit what, more about what happened in, uh, in that commit. And this one is really useful as the first step to jump onto cleaning up my commits. Git rebase interactive. Uh, and this particular example, this will give me a list of the last five commits. And then I can pick or squash or reorder or delete or reword or squash some more. And another prerequisite for using this command is again to know which Git editor you have. Sometimes we also need to use some extra force. But this is the one to be a bit careful with. Uh, when you're pushing with force outside your uh, local uh, lo local area and onto onto the remote, this is the one that where you potentially can uh, delete other people's uh, people's code. So I never I never want to do this unless I'm absolutely certain that I know what I'm doing. And there is this uh, option force with lease that will uh, add like an extra security uh, or extra safety for, you, for me so that I don't overwrite any work on the, on the rem remote branch in case a coworker has uh, committed something to it. Then there's also stash, git stash, where you can also git stash patch, where you stash something in your, in your purse 
uh, and pop it out of there for safekeeping. I think this is the one I want to uh, practice more with and, and learn how to like name the stashes and then you can make a list of stashes and then you can uh, uh, kind of organize uh, work in progress in, uh, in that way. There is also no more need for the very, very confusingly named checkout because now there, uh, the newer, uh, in newer versions of Git, uh, there is Git switch and Git restore. And Git switch deals with uh, branches and Git restore handles operations that change files. And I have completely forgotten how to use Git checkout, which is perfectly fine. <laughs> Here's also one that I'm really uh, happy with having found, because I tend to end up with a lot of local branches. So I needed a way to get rid of all of them at, at once. I wrote a blog, blog post about this one too that kind of deconstructs the, the command. And finally, from the talk title, git cherry pick. Git cherry pick means I can take a commit from one branch and apply it to a completely different branch. Not something I use often, but it's kind of fun when I do. I feel like a little bit of a badass when I use this one. And by the way, this type of operation, this only makes sense if I have been making good commits that are atomic and are, are commits that kind of uh, are, are wrapped up in a nice little package and preferably also has a good description to it. And we can't talk about Git without talking about merge conflicts, but I think my best advice here is to focus on preventing them. <laughs> I, I got, I've gotten really good at just making sure they don't happen in the first, in the first place. I don't always succeed, but that's kind of my goal. Um, and I think one of the most important things for me has been to really understand that it's, the, it's kind of the long-lived branches where, where the merge conflicts lurk on the, on the horizon. And some of the approaches I've talked about now for making more intentional commits, they also make it easier for me to separate work into more branches and pull, pull requests and getting those merged sooner rather than, than later. I've also found, found that I can practice, when, practice resolving a merge conflict when the stakes are really low and there's nothing to, to lose. Like you can make a dummy project to, 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 to test uh, getting some merge conflicts, you can get, you can create merge conflicts with yourself. And if you get really, really stuck, there's the oh shit git project, which is a project where KD Siler Miller uses plain English to describe how to get out of AMS. There's also a really nice uh, zine that Katie and Julia Evans made together, where they first explain Git fundamentals and then mistakes and, and how to fix them. Okay, so some key points I want to revisit and leave you with. Talk to other people about the hard, hard Git stuff. And if they're not patient about it, then go find someone who, who is. And remember that sometimes, if people suck at explaining something, it's often because they don't really understand it that well themselves. And if you are good friends with Git, then figure out how to be that person who others want to approach for help. And why learn more Git? Because it commits our documentation that we leave for the next person. And with that, I want to wish us all good Git luck Thank you for listening. <laughs>